Okay, I think I'll start since the majority of you is here. Um, so welcome to the exercise class. Um, today we're going to discuss two topics. First is majorization, and I hope to give you a bit more intuition about what majorization is, and we're going to look at very simple examples and also the main results, um, which you're, you're going to use in the exercise sheet. And then um, the second part would be about the, another optimal cooling problem uh, for a qubit, uh, but this time it will be a bit more complicated setting, and we're going to use some majorization arguments to prove that the cooling, in fact, is optimal. And the second, this optimal cooling part, as many future uh, exercises in this course will be based on the um, actual research paper. Uh, but we'll try to simplify it. Uh, in a way which would be understandable. Okay, so let us start with majorization. So I'll start a bit differently. So I'll just start um, with considering vectors and say that we have two vectors, um, R and S, which are two real d-dimensional vectors. And we say that um, R is majorized by S if there, are, there is a set of permutation matrices Pi and a probability distribution small pi such that we can write one vector um, R in terms of this probabilistically permuted vector S. So basically, um, one, one simple example of this is the following. So let us consider two dimensional vectors. Uh, suppose that the vector S is the vector one zero. Um, and let us take uh, all possible permutations that we can have on this state. So the first permutation would be um, change the first and the second entry, which would be this matrix, and which is analogous to the X poly matrix, by the way. And uh, P2 would be we don't permute anything, but let everything stay in their places. And let us take the... Um, the probability distribution with P1 equals P2 equals one half. So just the uh, usual um, homogeneous distribution. And then let us write the vector R uh, will be one half uh, P1S plus one half P2S. So the P1S just per will permute these two entries. Uh, so we would get one half zero one plus one half uh, one zero. And this will give us these uh, one half one half vector. And we'll see from this consideration that because we can write one half one half vector uh, in terms of this permutation matrices and some probability distribution, um, that one half one half vector is majorized by one zero vector. One can also uh, try this operation for more dimensional vectors, and also following the same the same intuition, one can one can from here show that in fact. Um, for any vector, which is, so say S is a vector of probability, which means, which basically means that all entries are positive and they all sum up to one. Uh, it always majorizes the uniform distribution. So the way to see it from here is that um, 
you already see that for any any kind of basis vector, we can uh, we can find a permutation of matrices such that it would uh, give us the uniform distributed vector. And but then if you take any vector uh, in this probability space, then it can be um, expressed as a linear combination of this basis vectors. And so then you just tweak your uh, probability distribution in, in this way. But this is uh, kind of uh, an important property to remember. So then there is another criterion of majorization. which is equivalent to the first one. Uh, I will not prove it here, uh, but you can look it up. Um, so say that we have, we take uh, again this uh, d-dimensional vector and we rearrange its elements in uh, non-increasing order. And we can do it for any vector, say vector r, and then its permuted version we label as r with the arrow down. And then the fir and then the elements would be R one down, R two down, and so on. We are D down. Uh, so R is majorized by another vector S if the following string of inequalities hold. R one down is less than or equal than S one down. R1 down plus R2 down is less or equal than S1 down plus S2 down, and so on. So the sum from J equal 1 to N uh, R J down is less or equal than uh, sum from J equal 1 to N S J down for any j from 1 to d minus 1. And for, for d, we have the equality because usually we just consider the probability vectors. So down would be equal to this sum. And also, yeah, this is equal to one if we look at the probability vectors. Um, okay, so let me give a simple example. So a simple example would be an example of uh, a vector of the angles of the triangle. So suppose that we have a triangle Right, with um, angles theta one, theta two, and theta three. Then the following, and the following relation holds. So the equilateral triangle, which is characterized, sorry, not theta, but pi, uh, by all angles being equal pi over three is majorized by any other triangle which is in its turn majorized by this kind of one line triangle which is not even a triangle in a sense but um, its angles still sum up to pi. So why is this? So because because here in this in arbitrary triangle we arrange the um, the angles in non-increasing order, so this inequality should hold. It means that um, the first the first angle that we put here should be bigger and equal than pi over three. And similarly, the sum of first two should also 
be bigger than or equal than 2 pi over 3. And the sums is always pi. So that's that another condition for 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 majorized vectors um, gives a gives an easy way to 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 see why this um, why this holds. Okay, uh, so this were all about uh, real valued vectors. Now, why do we use um, majorization for QM? Or for quantum mechanics. Uh, so one way to think about uh, where we can get the real valued vectors in quantum mechanics, these can be uh, the way uh, you, you immediately should think about Hermitian operators because Hermitian operators have only real valued eigenvalues. And the basically the, the set of the eigenvalues gives uh, gives us the uh, yeah this real valued vector from which we can again use this majorization theory that we have for real valued vectors. So we say that we have two Hermitian matrices R and S and then we say that R is majorized by S if the vector of the eigenvalues of R is majorized by the uh, vector of uh, eigenvalues of S. And for this uh, definition of majorization, we can just use the previous definitions that we have. And uh, analogously to the observation that we made there, that uh, every vector ma majorizes the uniform distribution, um, one, the density matrix which corresponds to the uniform distribution in quantum mechanics is the maxim, uh, describes the maximally mixed state. So, from this we can conclude that the maximally mixed state, uh, identity over D, is majorized by everything else. So maybe write it in words. Okay. Now uh, I will list a few important results which are useful um, or thinking about majorization. <clears throat> I'm not going to prove them, them here because some of them Ralph already proved and some of them are um, just a direct consequence of, of how we define majorization. So the first is Horn's lemma. And Horn's lemma says that R is majorized by S. This is equivalent to saying that um, Ri, uh, which is the eth element of this vector R, so these are two vectors, um, can be written as sum over J modulus Uij squared Sj. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, um, where Sj is the gth element of the of the vector S, uh, where Uij are the elements of over unitary. Okay. Um, next result is Schuhorn's lemma or theorem. Let's say it's theorem. So if I have um, a Hermitian, Hermitian matrix in principle it doesn't have to be a density operator but any Hermitian matrix um, with 
eigenvalues lambda i and diagonal elements or h i. Um, then it means that um, lambda, so the vector of eigenvalues, uh, majorizes the vector of diagonal elements. Okay, and the final theorem is, um, I wonder if there is space, maybe I'll, I'll write it here. Is so-called Ullmann's theorem. So Ullmann's theorem says that if two Hermitian matrices, R and S, are such that S majorizes R, then this is equivalent to saying that there exists a set of unitary matrices, say UJ, and there is a probability distribution, PJ, such that um, R can be written as, a, as this probabilistic application of these unitaries to the state, um, sorry, to the matrix um, S. So the sum over J, PJ, UJ, S, UJ dagger. So you can see that like Ullmann's theorem is basically just the uh, Hermitian matrices equivalent to how we looked at the majorization in the beginning. So here we just permuted, probabilistically permuted the elements of different vectors and uh, the Hermitian matrix analog of permutation would be applying unitaries. Um, okay. Uh, so now I'll talk a bit about uh, applications of where we can apply the notion of majorization. Uh, so I will erase something from the board and we'll start from the thermal state. So while I'm erasing the board, uh, if you want to learn more about majorization um, and generally you know, bring your um, knowledge about it in some kind of order, Michael Nielsen, so the same guy who wrote the famous quantum information theory book, has a, um, uh, has a basically small textbook on, on majorization. It's available online. So if you just Google Nielsen majorization, you'll get it. And I find it quite useful. I'm sorry, I'll just need to answer something here in the chat. Okay. Uh, so the first thing that we consider, okay. So we have, suppose that we have two thermal states. Um, so on the same, there are the states on the same system. Uh, we at the temperatures, at the inverse temperatures, beta one and beta two, such that uh, beta one is less than beta two and they're both bigger than zero. Uh, so then the claim is that if beta one is, is smaller than beta two, then one of these, one of these thermal states majorizes the other. Uh, can you already tell me what would be the relation? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Okay, then let's 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 go through it. So basically, the idea would be that then tau of beta one would be majorized by tau of beta two. And the way we will see it is because because the temp because the inverse temperature um, of the second um, of the second qubit of the second state would be bigger. Then for each each level, um, if we compare to the if for the population of each level, if we compare it to the population of the qubit with a temperature beta one, uh, the population of the qubit with a temperature beta two will be bigger. And so then. Uh, by this criterion here, we will just trivially get that uh, this state majorizes this. So, but let's go through this. So basically, what is tau of beta one? So suppose that I have the energy uh, basis, which ranges zero, E1, E2, and so on, EN. So then this would be the diagonal matrix. Uh, so going to be 1 over Z1, E to the power minus beta 1, E1 over Z1, and so on, E to the power minus beta EN over Z1. Uh, and tau of beta 2 will be the same, but with different, uh, with different normalization coefficient and different temperatures here. So I would get 1 over z2 e to, to the power minus beta 1, sorry, beta 2 e1, z2, so on, e to the power minus beta 2, E n z two. Okay. So then one thing we can consider is that, for example, let us take two um two elements here. So this element, say, and this element and then compare them. So basically these are e to the power minus beta 1 e1 over z1. z1 is sum over j e to the power minus beta 1 ej. And here we have e to the power minus beta 2 e1 over sum over j e to the power minus uh, beta 2 ej. So we want to, um, to find out what is the relation here. So we just multiply this side by this sum and the left side by, sorry, the, right, the left side by this sum and the right side by this sum. And what we get is e to the power minus beta 1 e1 uh, sum over j e to the power minus beta 2 ej. And on the other side, we have e to the power minus beta 2 e1 sum over j e to the power minus beta 1 ej. Uh, okay, so now what we would have is the following. Um, so here we would have sum over j e to the power minus beta 2 ej plus beta 1 e1. And here we would have sum over ej, e to the power minus beta 2 e1 uh, plus beta 1 ej. Uh, 
So now we just need to compare the, these two arguments for each, uh, for each element in the sum. So sorry for the mess, but let me write it here. So we compare beta 2 ej plus beta 1 e1 and beta 2 e1 plus beta 1 ej. Uh, and we basically take them both, take these two on the other side, and what we get is beta 1, sorry, beta 2 mi minus beta 1 um, ej minus e1 uh, right correct yes uh, and this is bigger um, or less than uh, sorry bigger or equal than zero so which means that uh, this is bigger or equal than zero uh, and here as well And here as well, ah, sorry, so here it's this way, but the arguments here are the other way, so this is the other way. Uh, this is also the other way. Uh, this is this way. Yes, so basically what we get is that for each, um, for each element here, so that if we take a population of, let's say, of the first level um, for, for the first temperature, beta 1, uh, this population is um, always less than the population of uh, the same level for the temperature beta 2. So that's the idea. Um, and then uh, this, this, all, this also follows from the fact that when, the in, when we say that the inverse temperature beta 2 is bigger than the inverse temperature beta 1, it means that the actual physical temperature T2 is less than the physical temperature T1. Um, and when the physical temperature is less, the higher is the energy level, the less populated it is, basically. Um, which means that for the... Uh, for the for the for the system with the lower temperature, the higher levels will be more populated. Sorry, the the the, lo the levels with lower energy will be less populated than the levels with the lower energy uh, for higher temperature. And from this, it follow we can just apply that um, that criterion here. Which, which trivially holds because this is less than this and this is less than this and so on. Uh, and, um, and get that this, uh, this vector is majorized by the other vector. Okay, so this was for the thermal states. Let me see if I have time to uh, get to the other examples. Um, okay, sadly, I don't think I have time. But what you also see in the in the uh, in the exercise sheet is how you can apply the notion of majorization for probability outcomes. Sorry, for measurement outcomes. So, for example, you suppose that the state of the d-dimensional system is described by this density matrix rho, and then uh, we measure the system in some basis. Uh, some orthonormal basis EK, like where EK are basis states. And then um, the probability vector that is given to you by this, uh, by measuring in this basis will be, um, will be always majorized by the set of the eigenvalues that initial density matrix had. So this is actually just a direct consequence of Schulhorn theorem. And also, Another interesting consequence is, for example, if you take um, um, 
if you take a matrix row, and then you have a set of projectors that you apply, and then you know that in the case when we don't know what exactly, what was exactly the result of the measurement, uh, so we have row set of the projectors pi, then the post measurement state, as you've seen in previous courses probably, is row prime, which is described by just summing up over this application of these projectors. Uh, and basically, what one can say that this post measurement state will be always majorized by the initial state of the system. Okay. Uh, so, one last thing about majorization before we go on a break. So, an, uh, there is another way to characterize majorization, but through so-called doubly stochastic matrices. So the doubly stochastic matrices are, so let's say, it's a matrix D. Um, which is which is a square matrix, and it's doubly stochastic if all elements are positive. Um, sum of each column and the sum of each row of the matrix. So it's here J, here I are equal to one. So for example common example of doubly stochastic matrix is the following. So it's T, then here it must be my one minus T because it must sum up to one here as well, and here is T. As you see for, for this matrix, each column and each row sum ups to one. Uh, okay, what is the interpretation of this matrix? Uh, and why is it important that the uh, the columns and the rows sum up to one. You can see this matrix as a sort of a channel which maps um, one probability distribution to the other probability distribution. So basically it can, um, it can be seen as this noisy communication channel where we have some input, which is a probability distribution PK, and some output, which is a probability distribution QJ. Uh, and then this, uh, this matrix basically gives us the probability um, of getting outcome QJ given that, um, sorry, getting the outcome J given that we input the, uh, the input K. So, And I think it's important to keep this analogy with the noisy communication channel in mind because I'm not sure if Lydia is going to talk about it this year, but last year while talking about resource theories, we were also talking about the resource theories of quantum channels and uh, the resource theory of noisy communication channels is one of the examples of um, where this can be applied. So. If we write it formally, we just write that QK is sum over J, P, K, um, given J, or sorry, um, so here we had QJ, let's not, uh, so here we have QJ equals sum over K, P, J given K, uh, P, K. And these are exactly the elements D, uh, GK? Yeah, D, GK. Why is this good also for majorization? 
Uh, ah, and also from here you can you can clearly see why we have this um, restriction of of like the the elements summing up to one, because we also want this distribution to be a valid probability distribution. So basically, um, for example, if we take and sum up this distribution over k's, then it should give us a one. Yes. Some of these, you also want to for, for the matrix it would be like some of those, or you also want, but why do we also need some of these? Ah, good, uh, good point. Yes, so for the column, so um, there are two, uh, two, so this is doubly stochastic matrix, that's why it's doubly, basically, because both rows and columns sum up to one. Um, just for, in this interpretation, indeed, you only need to sum up over, um, yeah, over J's here. For, and then that should hold for each k. Um, so this is just an additional, um, yeah, constraint. I think the first the first type is just the stochastic matrices that are called. Um, okay. It's the it's uh, so we're introducing these doubly stochastic matrices because. Um, I think like for usual stochastic matrices where only one of these condition holds, um, we cannot we cannot have this nice uh, connection to majorization. So one theorem which is important here is that If D is doubly stochastic, this is equivalent to uh, saying that, was it? Yeah, so if we have a vector R, then DR is majorized by R. It's also, uh, so the equivalence here means that if we have two vectors S and R, then there exists a doubly stochastic matrix such that S is dr. Okay, uh, very good. There is a small caveat while thinking about doubly stochastic matrices, which uh, is also important to remember is that, for example, if there are two vectors and, um, yeah, let's say S is majorized by R, then from this it does not follow that for any stochastic matrix D, DS will be majorized by DR. So you can think about, like, an example for this in your. Um, outside the class, but it's important to remember that kind of this uh, majorization does not, is not transitive. So application of it is not, does not translate to the, um, to the case where we apply the doubly stochastic matrix D. Sorry, of course it's transitive, but not in the sense of applying stochastic matrices. Okay. Uh, yes. I discussed. So the only kind of functions which are, um, which kind of preserve this majorization order, you've seen it. That you've seen it in the lecture. These are sh uh, sure concave functions. So uh, for this, you need to. For the other functions, it's um, it's not guaranteed. Okay, I think I'll make a break now before before going to the optimal cooling, and let us meet uh, again here at quarter to yeah quarter to one. So, I mean, if you looked at the previous exercise sheet, you could already play with some optimal cooling with over qubit with a Q thread. Um, now we'll look at the 
first just cooling and then um, the optimal cooling of a qubit using a um, d-dimensional um, quantum system. So this, as a disclaimer, this, this um, exercise is based on the research paper. So I'll put the archive number here. Um, so the exercise has two, I think, two, um, um, yeah, two points which are relatively easy, and then the last two parts of the exercise are are, are a bit more complicated. And it's fine if if you cannot solve them on your own, you can just look up the solutions, or if you're even more interested, you can just read the whole paper. But of course, we don't uh, we don't require you to do so. So if you if you just know. So the first two you would definitely be able to, you should definitely be able to solve, and then the last two you just need to know what's the idea kind of behind uh, the proof and so on. Uh, okay, so uh, the setting is as follows. So we have the qubit S, say zero and one. Uh, the energy gap is ds, and we have a larger dimensional system, which we call B, uh, which we order in energy. So here I mean, by ordering in energy, I mean that the state zero, the state where it, as we, which we label as zero, has the lowest energy is zero. Then the next by energy is the state one with energy E1 and so on until the last level, which we label as Emax. And this is the level dB minus one. Uh, so that the dimension of this of the system is dB. And what we want to do, we want to find the, um, the process which would allow us to um, optimally cool this qubit S. And the initial states are tau S beta and tau B beta. So both diagonal at some temperature beta. So physically, you can you can understand this as if both of these systems were coupled to a bath of a temperature beta, and so now they're now we uncouple them, uh, and now we want to apply some operation which would cool this qubit. Okay. Uh, also, another condition is that Emax. So the maximal gap of, so the maximal energy of the qubit, um, sorry, of the system B, so is bigger than the energy gap of the qubit S. We also, without the loss of generality, assume that the energy of the lowest level of the system B is zero. And also the temperature beta is bigger than zero, which makes it physical. Okay, so uh, we would like to ideally find an operation which cools this optimally, uh, but we don't know this operation yet, so we just want first to provide a bound. What is the um, what is the lowest temperature we can cool the this qubit s to? For this, we need to find uh, one virtual qubit within this. Uh, so first we want virtual qubit within the system B, which would allow us to um, to make this system S as cool as possible, given the uh, the energy levels of the system B. So can one can anyone tell me which virtual qubit should I choose?
Exactly, yes, that's the correct answer. So remember last time when we were discussing how we cool um, the, cub uh, the qubit with a virtual qubit using the swap? And in a, in a limit of infinite applications of this map, we would get, um, yeah, we would get the, the same result as if um, this virtual qubit was a real qubit, right? And basically, then the next, the next step to remember is, um, is to remember in which case uh, the, the temperature of the qubit um, is the lowest. So for example, you have, uh, you have the system of many levels. So which, which two levels have the biggest population gap? These are, or biggest population ratio, if, uh, if we're being precise. These are the level zero and uh, so the ground level and the most excited level. Okay, uh, is, this, is this logic clear to everyone? Okay. Um, then basically what we have is we're taking our qubit S and we're taking a virtual qubit uh, VB, which is as a zero and db minus one. Here we have ES. Here we have the max. Mm. Then from the from our previous considerations, the temperature beta star to which we can cool our our qubit after applying this operation many times uh, is Emax beta over ES. So one thing I, I forgot to mention, but this is, is as it's usually assumed in, in settings like this, when we use one system to cool the other, we always assume that after we use it once, we just we just take another copy, which is coupled to a bath, or we just like couple this one to a bath and wait until it equilibrates um, and use it again. So basically this uh, would be our bound. So this is bigger than V to zero, bigger than zero. Uh, and also from our previous considerations, obviously the new state of the system S, which would be the thermal state of the system S at the temperature uh, beta star, would majorize its initial state at the temperature beta, simply because beta star is bigger than beta. Okay, um, now, even though this operation allows us to achieve this cooling bound, this operation is not optimal, in which sense I'll, I'll explain now. So suppose that we are looking at, at the class of so-called coherent operations, which are um, characterized as follows. So we apply some big unitary on the joint um, system of systems S and B, and then we trace out the system B. And we're only left with the system S. And so this can be described as a channel uh, C of rho S, which is we trace out the system B after applying mu to the tensor product of rho s and tau b of temperature beta, mu dug it. Uh, yeah, in fact, the operation, the swap operation that we just considered here, that is usually considered while cooling, 
um, is one of such operations. So we apply a, a total swap on both systems and then we trace out um, the second system. But one can consider all, um, all such processes. Um, so one can prove that given this class of operations, in fact, this uh, beta star is indeed uh, the cooling bound, which means that um, C of rho S, so for any such operation U, uh, C of rho S is majorized by rho S star. So for any U. So this fact I will not prove here. Uh, if you want to see a proof of this, you need to read the paper. It's a bit involved. So just take it as um, just take it on my word. Uh, so basically what it means is that whichever operation we apply, we cannot do better than, uh, than cooling it to this beta star state. Okay. Um, now we consider the following operation. So Uh, so now I'll explain what operation actually is the optimal cooling in this case. So given a state uh, rho SB, which is a joint state of these two systems, uh, uh, this optimal unitary rearranges the angular values. of this joint state um, as largest in the subspace um, or for the state simply um, epsilon, sorry, zero, zero on S tends a product epsilon zero epsilon zero on B, second largest N zero, zero on S, epsilon one, epsilon one on B, and so on. So basically, um, it just, this, this optimal unitary kind of permutes this eigenvalues in such a way. Um, and the result of applying it can be written as follows. So we apply U optimal to rho SB. Then what we get is sum from I equals zero to DB minus one rho SB I. So these are just reordered eigenvalues. Um, zero, EI, zero, EI, plus uh, rho SB, D, B plus I, so reordered um, for the one as well.
Okay. Uh, so the claim here is that this operation is actually optimal in the sense that um, if we apply it, so let us call this operation um, A of row S, which would be yeah, just tracing out the B after applying this optimal operation. Uh, then A of rho S would majorize C of rho S, where C I would label our usual like cooling swap operation. So let's say that this is like C of rho swap. Which means that whenever I apply the operation A to the, to the state row S, it will always give me um, a cooler state than if I applied uh, an operation C, which is simply the swap with this um, colder virtual qubit. Uh, okay. And then from this, um, One can also show that a to the power n, so if I apply this operation n times, it would still majorize um, and applying the operation c n times. And in the limit of applying this operation uh, infinite number of times, we would indeed get our rho s star, which is rho s of the temperature, which is our cooling bound. So of course, um, the operation described here looks a bit, um, yeah, looks a bit complicated, but intuitively you can see that we, since we kind of arrange um, our eigenvalues as largest in the lowest energy um, subspace and um, uh, smallest in the largest energy subspace, then we kind of arrange them by energy and this, uh, this allows us to reach the cooler temperature. So I can, I can briefly say how can one prove this, um, just describing it in steps. Um, but you don't, you don't need to kind of, if you're, if you're struggling with this, um, don't try to like think about it too much. Um, just look up in the solutions or, um, the important point about this exercise to remember is, okay, which virtual qubit I need to take to in principle reach the cooling bound, which is the qubit with the largest energy gap and that indeed there is, there is a way to prove that this cooling bound is indeed the cooling bound and that in principle we have another process which allows to achieve it. Okay, so, uh, one can show that row S tends a product, sorry, row one tends a product, I think this marker is giving up, uh, tends a product sum tau S of a temperature beta, or yeah, let me name it tau B. Uh, and this is majorized by this. So some row two tensor product tau beta if row one is majorized by row two. 
Uh, to show this, this is just a simple exercise. Um, yeah, because you basically, um, yeah, you can just throw it by hand because this matrix is anyway diagonal. Um, and you can just write it out. Uh, okay, and then the idea is that this statement can be proved, proven by induction. So first show that uh, A of row S majorizes C of row S. Um, and this is this is pretty pretty uh, pretty much um, straightforward because row S here is just a two-dimensional system. So you just need what you need to do is uh, you need to trace out the system B from here, uh, which is also pretty easy because uh, because all these terms are diagonal. So you will just get some sum over these reordered eigenvalues, and you, you need to compare. These, uh, this sum to, to what the usual swapping operation gives you. Then I need to prove that uh, if row one is majorized by row two, then A of row one, oh, sorry, if row one majorizes row two, then A of row one uh, majorizes C of row two. Uh, for this, you need to use this hint, basically. Uh, and finally, assume that A n times application on row S majorizes the C n times application row S. And from this, show that if I apply it one time more, this would still majorize. Sorry, it's really A of this, C of this. I mean, you can see that, um, so this is just the first step of induction. This is just an intermediate step to be able to make a step here, because here we see that this is also a valid density matrix, this is a density matrix. This is, this majorizes this, which means that if we prove the two, it would mean that if I once more apply A to this, um, this would still majorize uh, the matrix which I obtained by applying C once more to this matrix. Okay. Uh, yeah, and finally, as I said, you would need to show that uh, in the limit of and going to infinity, indeed, this would give you the the thermal state at a temperature uh, B star, theta star. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, the process of proving this is a bit complicated. If you don't manage, it's fine. This is not an exam question. Uh, important things were already said, like in a first in a first part. Uh, okay. Now, are there any questions about this? Okay. No questions. Any questions about the previous exercise sheet? Okay. Um, okay, then a few words about the exercise sheet. 
So the first, the first exercise just concerns the majorization and its properties. Um, also like the things that we discussed about triangles or uh, measurement outcomes or post-measurement state, um, the doubly stochastic matrices, the thermal state. Um, also maybe a hint which I didn't give uh, directly in the exercise is, so we have the following claim in the exercise sheet that if row one majorizes row two, and row one and row two are passive, then uh, row one has lower energy, I mean average energy. So yeah, E1, less than E2. Um, so to prove, to the hint I'll give you is, to prove this you need to use, um, sure concavity. So basically, you just show that energy uh, is sure concave. And then that basically gives you the, the, the result. So yes, I didn't touch the notion of sure concavity or sure convexity in this exercise class, but I think yeah, Ralph already explained it quite well in the lecture. Okay, if there are no questions or comments, then I think you're free for today. Thanks a lot for attending. <laughs>